Well, let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Since you guys are sitting down, I won't make you stand back up. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we're grateful as we approach your word today, God. As we open it up, that you open us up to receive. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We didn't come today to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. So Holy Spirit, be our teacher, be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Also, God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. We'd ask it for all of our brothers and sisters, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are both preaching and hearing the gospel. Lord, we would bless them as you would bless us. We bless our Baptists and Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics and Pentecostal brothers and sisters. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest, for Oak Valley, for Ecclesia Trinity, for the way, God. We thank you for our uh, Adventist and Catholic brothers and sisters, Lord, for the four square denominations and the assemblies of God, all those who are lifting up the name of Jesus this day, preaching your truth, we would bless them as you bless us. God, also, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. We would ask that you watch over them, that you bless them, that you deliver them, Lord. May they endure to the end, to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. Amen. All right, those of you that aren't sitting, you can have a seat now. God is good. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew chapter number two today. And the title of today's message as you turn there is The Trouble with Christmas. It was in December of 1903 that after many attempts, the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, were successful in getting their flying machine off the ground and into the air at Kitty Hawk. Thrilled over their accomplishment, they telegraphed this message to their sister, Catherine. We have actually flown 120 feet. We will be home for Christmas. Catherine, excited about the news, hurried over to the editor of the local newspaper and showed him the message, and he glanced at it without a second thought and just said, oh, that's nice, the boys will be home for Christmas. Totally missing the big news that for the first time in history, man had actually flown. I want to read to you a story in Matthew, the second chapter, about some other people who missed the headline, some people who missed the big news. Matthew chapter 2 verse number 1 starts out and it says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Verse number 2 saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Verse number 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, for all of us, as we take a look at this story, we've read this story, we know this story, we, we have identified with this throughout our lives, but I want to just draw out some truths from what we've read so far. First of all is this, is that there were people who when Jesus was born, that they came to worship Jesus, and, and they came to the leaders that were there of that day, came to King Herod, and King Herod and all Jerusalem heard this news. It created quite a stir that wise men from the east showed up. They must have been notable men to, first of all, get an entrance with the king. And second of all, for people to take notice and to listen to what they were saying. Now, King Herod, the Bible says, was troubled. King Herod should have been troubled, too. King Herod was a wicked man. King Herod was not a nice guy. Yes, he had some accomplishments. He helped the Jews out, building the temple, that sort of a thing, and they were very grateful for that. But King Herod was a murderous egotist. This guy was all about himself, and anything that came against his rule, his reign, his kingdom, he would just take people out. In fact, he took his own mama out. He took his children out. What kind of a jerk does that? I mean, this guy was really bad. This guy was killing his brother. He he, he would just take people out. He was a murderous man. And therefore, when he heard that there was one who was born king of the Jews, he had a problem with that because that came against his own kingdom. But I want you to notice something else. Not only was Herod troubled, but the Bible says that all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. Think about that for a second. These are the Jews. These are the religious leaders of the day. If anybody should have been happy about Jesus being born, it should have been the people who were waiting for him for centuries. It should have been the people who had received the prophecies about him. It should have been the people who were waiting for the coming Messiah that should have rejoiced and celebrated and said, ha ha, Herod, hey, man, get ready because he's going to kick you out of here. He's going to take you down. You know, the Jews believed that the Messiah would be a military leader and would take out the Roman government and take the, the nation out 
from underneath their rule and their authority. So they really should have been like, man, this is great news. But notice what the Bible says. The Bible says that all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. As the king went, so went the people. Now, why all the trouble with Christmas? Why all the trouble with a baby being born in a manger? Why the trouble with wise men from the east coming to worship him? Here's why. Because their way was being replaced by the way. King Herod, here he is. He's the ruler. He's got all sorts of authority. He, he's the one that people are looking to to find out about how they should do life. He, he's got all the accolades. He's got all the wealth. He's got the accomplishments. He's got people that are serving him. And if there's one who was born king, see most kings when they're born, they're born a prince. This king is different. He was born the king of the Jews. Herod was the king of the Jews. Herod was the one who was set up under the Roman rule to govern these people. And yet now there's going to be a new ruler. There's going to be a new king. And Herod didn't like that because his way was being replaced by the way. Why, why the trouble with Christmas when it came to the Jewish people? I mean, shouldn't they have been happy? Shouldn't they have been dancing in the streets? Shouldn't they have been celebrating? Shouldn't they have gone down to Bethlehem and taken that child and put him in the palace? Shouldn't they have done something like that? Well, no, because their way was being replaced by the way. You know, the religious leaders of that day that, that Herod inquires of and finds out where was the child to be born, they, they knew the scriptures. They, they knew all of what was going to be coming to pass. They knew what was supposed to take place from the Bible, and yet they're not rejoicing. Why? Because their way was getting replaced by the way. Think about it. Jesus, in his lifetime, during his teaching and, and in his interaction with people, Jesus encountered these same religious leaders, didn't he? And he called him out. He said, you guys love the praises of man. You want the best seats at the feast, and, and you want to be greeted in the marketplace. And you, you pray long prayers so that people will notice you. I mean, it's all about you, and it's not about God. Your worshiping is just with your lips, but your hearts are from him, far from him. See, their way was being replaced by the way. See, at Christmas time, the news is going to be troubling to people because everything changes at Christmas. Oh, I need to say that again because I need a great big amen on that one. Everything changes at Christmas. See, when you encounter the Christ child, you cannot leave things alone. It cannot stay the same. Because when Jesus came, he came to take out the ruler of this world. And I'm not talking about Herod right now. See, in the beginning... When Eve was deceived and she gave to her husband Adam and he entered into willful rebellion, they handed over the rulership of this world over to Satan. He usurped authority and he became the prince of the power of the air and the whole world was under his sway. See, as the king goes, so goes the nation. And so Jesus didn't come just because he was checking things out. Jesus did not come to this earth just to see how it was going and see if we were doing okay. Jesus did not come just to be an earthly king. No, he came to change everything. He came to take out that rulership of the devil, and he came to take his rightful position as the one who was born king. You cannot encounter the Christmas story without changing everything because things cannot stay the same when Jesus comes on the scene. See, we didn't need another holiday. They had plenty of holidays. What we needed was a savior. And Jesus came to be our savior. He came to be our king. He came to be our Lord. And he came to change everything. Christmas changes everything. It's no different today. See, people, they don't like the news of Christmas because it it, it causes them to admit their need. I need a savior. I, I, I need forgiveness. I can't do this on my own. See, pride and our way will get in the way of the way. But Christmas changes. See, we we can't come to a baby in the manger and stay the same. When we come to Christmas and and, and when those of us that are Christians, when we we start to say, you know, I'm going to worship God, it's going to ruffle some feathers. The news about Jesus is troubling. If If you haven't noticed in the news reports over the decades... In our nation, Christmas is increasingly becoming more and more offensive to the world. People have trouble with Christmas. Oh, they don't mind if you do your own thing, 
but just don't try and make a change. Don't try and enforce that. Don't, don't try and do that. And here you are as a Christian saying, I'm just coming to worship the king. I'm coming to worship the one who was born king. Man, the people of this world, your, your neighbors, your coworkers, your relatives, they're going to start to have some trouble. Why? Because Christmas changes everything. And they will be forced to replace their way with the way if they acknowledge the truth of what's going on. Your worship is going to disturb other people. You know, it's going to disturb your family members when you say, you know what, we're going to church on Christmas morning. Well, wait a second, we're not going to have as much time with the family. No, we're not, but I'm going to worship the king at Christmas. There's going to be people who have trouble at the work party when you say, listen, I'm not drinking because I don't want to be out of my mind because I, I, that would be distasteful. That would be something that would grieve the Lord. And I, I want to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. I'm going to worship the king at Christmas. I, I'm not going to do that stuff. I'm not going to jump in with you. It's going to offend people and they're going to be trouble. See, all throughout the Bible, whenever Jesus shows up on the scene, whenever somebody starts talking about Jesus, it troubles people. Acts chapter 16, the apostle Paul and his companions are traveling, and here they are, and they get this door of opportunity open. They travel over to Macedonia, and here they are. They go and find out where people are praying, where people are gathering, and, and they're gathering down by the river. And so they head down to the river. They meet up with a lady named Lydia, and there Lydia hears their words. She believes, and she says, hey, why don't you guys come over to my house? And so they go over to her house, and they're hanging out, and they're, they're going around talking to people and just telling them about Jesus, really not doing much. And one day while they're traveling, uh, a young young girl who is demon possessed starts following them around and saying these men have the words of life of almighty God and she starts to yell at them and she's crying out about them now we would have thought hey that's cool you know this little girl she she used to be a, a, a fortune teller and people heard their fortunes and and then it would come to pass and and her her slave masters made a lot of money and now here she is saying these guys have the words of life that's a good thing because people will trust her right we would have thought that's, that's wonderful. And yet the Apostle Paul, he's got the discerning of spirits going on. He's bugged, right? He knows that that's a demon spirit. He knows that that's not something that they should appreciate. That's something, this little girl's bound. This little girl is demon possessed. This little girl is a slave. This little girl, uh, she needs to be delivered. And so rather than think about the, the, the things that are taking place, he, he just gets bugged in his spirit. And finally he turns around and he says, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And he casts the demon right out of her that very hour. Now, there should have been celebration. There should have been rejoicing because this little girl's free. She, she's delivered. And yet, her masters, they're not thinking about this little girl's deliverance. They're thinking about their income. And they get enraged. What are we going to do? See, their way was being replaced by the way. And all the apostle Paul had done was just travel around, made some relationships, talking to people about Jesus, and cast a demon out of a girl. Look at what takes place. Acts chapter 16, verse 20. And they brought them to the magistrates, the leaders. And they said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Why? Because they're replacing their way with the way. Verse 21. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, Romans, to receive or to observe. See, they, they caused all this trouble. Why? Because they were preaching Jesus Christ. Now, now they go to prison. You know the story. They're there in the midnight hours singing praises and hymns to God. And all of a sudden, the prison doors are open. But look at what happens in Acts chapter 17. They keep traveling on. And as they travel on, they meet up with a guy named Jason. And they're hanging out with Jason. And, and, and so they're traveling around. And, and while they're traveling around, the same thing happens. The people start to get bugged. And they go and they grab Jason and his household. And they drag him before the leaders. And they say, the same guys who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And look at what it says, Acts chapter 17, verse number 7 and 8. It says, Jason has harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Oh my, that sounds a lot like, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And the king, Herod, was bugged. See, they were, they were having a hard time because their way was being replaced by the way. Verse number eight, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. See, the, the preaching of Jesus to people who are outside of the church will always be troubling. It will always disturb them. Why? Because it forces them to change. They're, they're not comfortable with something different than what they're in. See, sin is easy. Sin is comfortable. Sin, uh, the, the, the way of the world, there's no pressure. 
You're not going against the grain. You can kind of just float through life. See, people have no problem with Christmas as long as it doesn't require them to change. But it does. It does. Everything changes at Christmas. Let's not miss the point of Christmas. What is the point of Christmas, you say? Is it just Jesus? Is it, is it just the baby in the manger? Is that, is that really the point? Is it just that Jesus is the reason for the season? Well, yes, we could say a big yes and amen to all that. But remember what the angel proclaimed to the shepherds keeping their watch by night. Luke chapter number 2, verse number 14 says this, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. See, that's really the point of Christmas is that deity robed himself in humanity and he came to bridge the gap. God did not come to trouble us, even though Jesus said, don't think I came to bring peace, but a sword. Division, right? Those who are of his own household will be his enemies. Why? It's going to divide. There will be trouble that comes. Why? Because to those that are perishing, the message of Jesus and the cross is the stench of death. But to those who are alive and those to whom receive it, it's the fragrance of life. See, for those who are Christians who receive Jesus, the message of Jesus and the message of Christmas is peace. It will only bring peace. Why? Because with Jesus comes peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He's the one that said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, and I I do not give as the world gives. The world takes it away, but I give it to you and I leave it with you. See, the point of Christmas is that God loved us so much that he didn't want to be without us. Therefore, he stepped into time. He stepped into humanity. He stepped into space. And therefore, he took upon himself what was necessary in order to bring us to him so that we could change. That's what the message of Christmas is all about, not just a baby in a manger. No, that baby is God in the flesh. That baby changes everything. That baby is the one who went to the cross and who died for us. He is the one who was and who is and who is to come. It was the ancient of days wrapped up in a human form. Oh my goodness. Changes everything. Let's not miss the point at Christmas. To the world, Jesus is trouble, but to those who believe in him, he is our peace. See, the chief of priests, the, the, the elders, the scribes, they knew where to find Jesus. They knew exactly. The moment Herod asked him, what do they do? They point straight to the scripture. Bethlehem of Judea, right? You are not the least among the rulers. For out of you will come a governor, a ruler. He will rule the nations. But see, they didn't continue to quote the verse. It stops right there. The verse goes on in the Old Testament. And it says, and his beginnings are from everlasting. This is the eternal one. See, they missed the point. Not just a natural human ruler, not just a Messiah who would be a military leader. No, this is God robed in the flesh. And they missed the point, and they never... Listen, guys, they were five miles away. Five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and they never went. You don't see the chief of priests. You don't see the scribes. You don't see the Pharisees. You don't see any of the religious leaders going down. No, you see some wise men and some shepherds going and bowing before the king of glory. Keep your finger in Matthew chapter 2. Turn with me to John chapter number 5. John chapter number 5, Jesus grows up and he starts talking to these same religious leaders. Starts talking to the people. And look at what he says in John chapter number 5, starting in verse number 39, and we're going to read verse number 40. John chapter 5, verse number 39, it says this, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. In other words, it's not just about a mental acknowledgement of the scriptures. There are people who I've encountered who know more Bible than I do. And I've been around for decades in this stuff, guys. I've been studying this my entire Christian walk. And yet they could school me on what the scriptures say, and yet they don't know Jesus one bit. There are people with PhDs in religion and and, and who have studied the Bible inside and out and who could tell you things that would blow your mind, and yet they have no relationship with Jesus Christ. See, he says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. But listen, if it's just words on a page, if it's just cold, dead religion, and if it doesn't point you to Jesus and a living relationship with the living way, then it is going to do you no good. He goes on in verse number 40 and he says, but you are not willing, not willing to what? Not willing to come to me that you may have life. 
In other words, you're not going to find life just in words on a page. If those words don't point you to Jesus, they won't do you any good. But if you're willing, if you will come, the invitation is open. It's been sent out. And now Jesus is bidding anyone who will come, you may come and approach. Now, why? Because I have come. I have been robed in flesh. I was the baby in the manger. I was the one who went to the cross, who died, but now who is alive and who has opened the way into heaven. And now you can come to me and receive eternal life. See, it was at Christmas time that life came to us here on the earth. But it does us no good if we don't come to him. See, we have a will, we have a choice. We can either hear about Christmas and acknowledge it and know about it, or we can not miss the point, come to him. See, the point of all this, if you get nothing else, get this. The point of all of this is that we are to worship the Christ of Christmas. We are to fall down before him. Look at what, back to Matthew chapter 2. Look at what happened with these wise men, right? You know why they're wise men? It's because they had the wisdom of God. They saw the star. They responded. They spent time. They spent effort. They spent energy. They traveled for hundreds, if not thousands of miles at their own expense. And they came and they worshiped Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse number 11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. Now, I want to show you how they don't miss the point, okay? Because sometimes we start to look at the Christmas story and we start to miss the point because you hear something like that. They, they saw the young child with his mother Mary and they're in a house. Wait, I thought they were in a stable. So that means that Jesus must have grown up a little bit because now he's a young child. Maybe he's about two years old because Herod killed all the babies that were about two years old. See, all of a sudden we've gotten off the point, haven't we? Now all of a sudden, listen, young child could be translated baby and don't you think Mary and Joseph had enough sense that, hey, we cannot stay in this stable we need to get into a house. And the census is taking place, so people may have moved out after they participated in the census, and so there may have been some vacancies around town. Yes, they had no room at the inn, but they might have had a house for rent. And so they might have gotten into a house. See, we get off the point. The point of it is not about how old Jesus was at this time or, or whether or not they were in a house or a stable or any of that kind of stuff. The point of it is, is that look at what happens. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and what did they do about it? And they fell down and worshipped him, and they opened their treasures to him, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Once again, we can get off gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What is that all about? Well, gold, that's, that's, that's a kingly gift. That's, that's fit for a king. Frankincense, well, that's the priestly gift. That, that's something that they, they would burn with the incense, and they would wave it before the Lord. And myrrh, that was, that was foreshadowing his death. But see, I want you to notice something. They fell down, and they worshiped him, and they opened their treasures to him. We, we've mentioned this before, but I think as we're saying it again in this church service today, worship will cost you something. Your worship will cost you time, effort, energy, your dignity. It's going to cost you financially. It's going to cost you yourself. See, these gifts not only represented King Jesus, but they represented the ones who were giving them, right? Anytime you give a gift to somebody, that's your heart and your generosity going towards someone else. That, that's who you are saying, I appreciate you and I value you and I love you enough to give something of myself. And they open their treasures to him. See, there was a life that was laid down, not just in outward expression, but now in substance form. Now this is a part of myself going before you. See, we need to realize and recognize this Christmas season and all of our lives. That our worship will cost us. Our worship will cost us everything. Our, our lives. See, worship is not a song. Worship is sacrificial obedience. Laying down our lives before the Lord. Opening our treasures to Him. Appreciating God enough to do what it is He requires of us. We need to worship the Christ of Christmas. See, the wise men worshipped. But the world wouldn't. The wise men came. But the world stayed. And in our lifetime, we need to recognize that we can fall into the same trap. That, it, that we can get so caught up in exterior things and peripheral things that we miss worshiping Jesus this time of the year. See, there will be trouble when it comes to Christmas. 
I, I don't know about you, but there have been times where the announcement of Christmas has brought trouble to me. Oh, my goodness, Christmas time's coming. Oh, man, and all of a sudden you break out in a cold sweat. You start calculating how much you're going to spend on gifts, right? And some of you in this room right now, you're calculating, well, you know, I've already broken through the first barrier, the second barrier. You know, I'm, I'm up into that third tier level of, of uh, you know, we're starting to take out mortgages on the house and stuff like that. See, we can get caught up in periphery. Sometimes we, we get caught up in, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to spend time with people that I don't like. You know, I, don't, I just don't know that I can bear it. Once again, the in-laws are coming. Man, just stay still right now. Do not make a move. Just straight ahead, okay? But see, we can get caught up in so many other things, but the announcement of Christmas should not bring stress and strain and worry and fear and doubt and unbelief. No, the announcement of Christmas should bring a celebration. We should rejoice. And our response should be to bow before the king and to worship and to open our treasures. Lord, whatever you want, it's all yours. Psalm chapter 2. It's a messianic psalm. Turn there with me in Psalm book of Psalms, chapter number two, it's talking about the Messiah. It starts out with, why do the nations rage against the Messiah, the anointed one of God? There's trouble when Jesus shows up on the scene. In the last three verses of Psalm two, verse number 10, 11, and 12, God gives us how we should respond to the Messiah, how we should approach Jesus, the King. Verse number 10, it says, now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. In other words, listen up. I'm about ready to tell you how you are to respond to Jesus, how you are to approach. Verse number 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. See, Jesus, uh, in, in, in our time, in our day and age, has been depreciated. People have t-shirts that say, Jesus is my homie. There's been a, a thing that has come out since a stupid movie came out a while back. People praying to baby Jesus because they like the baby Jesus better. See, the reason why they like the baby Jesus better is because they don't think that baby Jesus will bug them about their life. No one likes seeing a Jesus hung on a cross. No one likes seeing a Jesus beaten, bloodied, whipped. No one likes seeing the lamb that was silent before its shears going to the slaughter, laying down his life. Oh, I want to see the baby Jesus. I want to pray to the baby Jesus because he doesn't bug me about my life. But listen, that baby Jesus is to be respected and feared and reverenced and awe. That is God in the flesh. And we do not take that lightly because that is the one who is the Ancient of Dates. That is the King of Glory robed in humanity. He is to be respected. He is to be uh, in, in, in reverence of. He is to be feared greatly because that baby was the one who was responsible for the rise and the fall of the nations. That baby is the one who kicked Satan out of his position and took over the throne of the universe. That baby is the one who was given the highest name above all names. That baby is the Savior of the world. He is to be feared and to be respected. That's who that baby is. Verse number 12, kiss the son. Kiss the son. You know the word for worship is a different word than it is here, but the word for worship means to bend forward and to kiss. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath has kindled but a little. See, this is God Almighty. The book of Hebrews tells us it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Therefore, we come with reverence. Therefore, we come with respect. We come with awe and we bow before him and we worship him. Look at the last part of the verse. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. See, we don't have to have trouble at Christmas. We can have the peace of the Christ child in our hearts. We can have the peace of that baby. We can have the peace of the one who is the prince of peace in our lives. There will be trouble at Christmas. There will be people who don't understand your worship. It's going to be people who hear about the announcement of Christ and because it's forcing them to change, they're going to have some trouble in their lives. But even though they're troubled, our job is not to be troubled with them. Our job is to simply serve him and to spread the good news. That's it. That's your job, church. This Christmas season, your job is simply to serve the Lord and to spread the good news. Why all the trouble at Christmas? Well, as Charles Spurgeon put it so eloquently, there is infinite power even in an infant Savior. Everything changed at Christmas time. Let's not miss the point and trouble ourselves, but rather let's worship with awe and with fear. I'd like to close today with an exhortation I've used before at Christmas time, but I think it's appropriate for all of us today. May the gifts at Christmas time remind us of God's greatest gift in His Son, Jesus Christ. May the Christmas lights remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. 
May the Christmas tree remind us of another tree that Jesus hung upon when he died. May the Christmas carols remind us of the song that the angels sang, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. And may the Christmas season remind us in every way of Jesus Christ, our King. Come on, let's worship the Lord this Christmas season. Today, before anybody gets up, before anybody leaves this place, I want to just give you an opportunity. Because it's not enough just to sit in church service and hear a Christmas message and not give you the opportunity to come and to worship Him, to lay down your life before Him in sacrificial obedience. See, sometimes we're so foolish in the American church, we think that just because people attend church, that makes them a Christian. When nothing could be further from the truth. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible to say you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Nor in the Bible to say that because you attend a church or religious service and say, I'm a Christian, that that gets you headed for heaven. You know, that's like me saying, you know what, I really, really, really want to be a fish. So I decide I'm going to go down to the Pacific Ocean, sit in the water, call myself a fish, and that makes me a fish. You know what's going to happen if I sit there long enough? I'll turn into pruny, slimy human. And if I try and go under the water and swim around like a fish, I won't be able to have enough breath I'll eventually die in that water. See, in the same way, what makes us think that we can come into a church service, call ourselves a Christian, that makes us a Christian. Jesus told a story, parable, about a king who gave a great banquet for his son. He invited people and they wouldn't come. And so he said, well, the banquet isn't going to be empty. I'm going to fill it up because my son is worth that. And so he sent his servants to the highways and the byways and they gathered people in. Now, we would have thought, that's great, that's good, they came in. But as the king was walking through the banqueting hall, he found somebody who wasn't dressed appropriately for the wedding. And he cast him out. See, we can sit in church service, call ourselves a Christian, but if we're not right with God, then we're not going to make it. And I want to make sure today that you make it. That you head for heaven, denying your presence in hell. You say, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. Well, isn't that convenient? You know, the Bible talks about hell. Old New Testament, Jesus himself spoke of it. Just because you say it isn't real doesn't make it go away. That's like me saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. You know, if I stand on the slow lane of the freeway long enough, I'll come face to face with one sooner or later. You're going to have to deal with the reality of hell. God loves you so much that he doesn't want you to go there. That's why he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, so you didn't have to go to hell. But you could be with him in heaven forever and ever. Sometimes people say, well, I don't have to worry about that because all roads lead to heaven. Do you know that all roads do not lead to heaven? You said, but wait a second, the the invitation was open. You you said that. Yeah, the invitation was open, but not everybody receives it. Why? Because the road is narrow, and there are few who find it. But the path to destruction is wide. It's open. You can do whatever you want to do here on the earth, but if you don't do this God's way, you're not going to make it. Today, I want to shine some light on the path and show you. So listen up. Give me a couple more minutes of your attention, then we'll let you go. Don't let anything distract you right now. So in this place, you said, well, you know what? I was raised in church. Parents told me you're Christians growing up. I believe that I'm a Christian because I was raised in church. Parents hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? Went to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school, catechism class. You're born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. We're Christians, right? Wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents raised you in church, tell you're Christian? take you to religious classes, you wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or that because you're born in America that you get to go to heaven. And again, nowhere, check it out, nowhere do we see in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. You might be thinking, but pastor, you don't understand. Uh, not only when I was a child did I go to church, but in my last church I helped out, I volunteered, I served in the, and sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church and taught in the Bible classes. It's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where you help out, serve in church, volunteer. People think of you as a leader. You get to go to heaven. God's not looking for your volunteer hours sheet or your membership card before you can enter the gates of heaven. If that's how you're trying to get into heaven, you're not going to make it. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, hold on a second, because, you know, uh, not only that, but, you know, I know God. I know about Jesus. I, I celebrate... Easter and the resurrection, sing the songs of Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. I believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Well, that's great. You know, the demons believe that too. They're not Christians. They're not headed for heaven. 
The devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. There were lots of people that knew a lot more scriptures, knew a lot more about God than we did during Jesus' day that never came to him like we talked about. So everybody look up here at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head, not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right, but rather this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. All throughout the Bible, he's looking for your heart. In fact, Jesus was speaking to one of the Pharisees, like we talked about, one of the religious leaders of his day, by the name of Nicodemus. And as he talked to Nicodemus about the same thing that we're talking about today, he didn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, whoa, you're doing great. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know, I know. We've seen that in movies. We've read about it in blogs on the internet. That's some weirdo, out of control, crazy Christianity. I don't want to have any part of that. But listen, if you don't have any part of that, you will have no part in the kingdom of heaven because Jesus said you must. Not it's a suggestion, not it's a way. It's the way. You must be born again. Now, let's not let society, movies, Hollywood, books, television, and the internet define for us what being born again is. Let's find out what being born again really means from the Bible. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That's pretty gross, right? Pretty graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and again, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to this message today, to invite Jesus in your heart, be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Here's what it's going to look like. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes and just take a personal moment to take personal inventory of where you're at with God. I'm going to ask you this question. What if today was your last day on the earth and you died? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? I want you to answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Now, some of you are going to answer this way. You're going to say, well, I think I'd go. Maybe I'd go. I I hope so. I I really don't know. And some of you are going to say, no, I know that I wouldn't make it if I died today. If that's you in any of those categories, then as you're thinking about that, as you're answering that question, you're going to identify where you're at with God. And then I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands pop together just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to respond by simply raising your hand if you're in any of those categories. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying something. You're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You could put it right back down. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, wait a second, why am I going to do all that? I might be embarrassed if I do that. Yeah, you might be, but listen, the people around you got their heads bowed, their eyes closed, no one's looking, no one's criticizing, no one's judging, no one's condemning. I'll see your hand go up, and then you can put it right back down, because Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up. Jesus said, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. That's what we want, right? But he says, if you deny me, I will deny you. So your call, your choice, you can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right, or you can respond today by simply raising your hand. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, I can see you guys wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, put the burger down. Time to get your hand up, okay, if you need to do this. Also, wherever you're at, watching online across the nation and around the world, God sees and God's watching. And then right after we see all the hands go up, We're going to lead you in a prayer. We'll gather together. We're going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Okay? It's that simple. It's that easy. If you want to be included in that prayer, get ready. I'm going to ask everybody at this time, please bow your heads. Please close your eyes. I want to ask you, what if today was your last day on the earth? Where would you go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. Check yourself out. Where are you at? Would you make it? If you don't know, you hope so. If you're maybe in, if you know you wouldn't go, maybe you're running from God instead of to God, come on, this is your time. If you're not sure, make sure. If you've never done this, come on, this is your day to do it. Let's go for God. If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I describe it. You're ready to get your hands up. 
Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time to respond. This is your moment of salvation. One, two, three. Let me see your hands if that's you. Thank you. There's one, two, three. God bless you. Who else? Four, five, six, seven, eight. Got you up on top over there. Thank you. Nine. Got you. Ten up there. Eleven. Thank you. Who else? Who else? Eleven. Eleven. Twelve in the family room. I got you on that side. Thank you. Twelve. On this side, 13, 14, 15, 16. Thank you. God bless you guys. 16, 17, 18 in the family room. Got you over on that side. Thank you. If I did not already see your hand, just get up high for me right now. 18, 19. God bless you right up here. Thank you. Thank you. 19, 20 over there. I got you over there. Thank you. God bless you. 20, 21 up top. Okay, thank you. God bless you. If you think I saw your hand, you can put it down. But if you don't think I saw you yet, come on, put it up high for me right now if that's you. 20, thank you, 21, thank you, 22, got you right here. Who else today? Who else? You say, I I don't think you saw me, Pastor. Just wave it at me. Give me a little wave if that's you. Anybody else? There's about 22 wise people. Anybody else real quick? Just want to make sure, want to make sure. If your heart's beating out of your chest and you're wondering, is he talking to me? Yeah, yeah, I'm talking to you right now. God just called you out. Where are you at? About 22 wise people. Thank you, I, I got you right there. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you, 23 right there, got you. Yes, anybody else? Real quick, we're going to pray together. You want to be included in that prayer? Come on. It's that simple by raising your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? 23? Yeah, I got them. Thank you. Thank you for helping me out there. Last call, last call. Anybody else? Real quick. Thank you. Got you right there. 24. Oh, don't you just feel number 25. Number 25, come on, if that's you. Up on top. Where you at? Where you at? Up on top. They're pointing every which way. Right? Got you up there. Thank you, number 25. God bless you. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Woo! All right, all 25 of you, number 26, 27, 28, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together, just like we said. Okay, so once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend, once you get in the aisle and meet me up front so we can pray together today. Okay? Now, if you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, you can come too during this time. Uh, Parents in the family rooms, if your children raise their hand, just ask them, did you raise your hand? Because your eyes might have been closed. That's cool. All right? Bring them. They're welcome at this time. Maybe you're sitting next to somebody. You can nudge your neighbor and say, hey, come on, friend. I'll go with you. Let's all stand. No one leaves during this time. Let's welcome them. You come right now. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on down to the front. Come on. Let's pray together. Jesus, I believe. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. You. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Whole families are coming right now. Come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Jesus, I belong. From the back, from the foyer, from the family rooms. Come on. You're the reason. You're the reason that I They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. There's room for you. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, let's keep it going for them. They're still coming. Jesus, I believe. If you need to come, just make it ready to the front right now. Come on. Come on. Jesus, I belong. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on, make your way to the front right now. They're still coming. Come on, come on, you can come, you can come. All right, hey, everybody up front, put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing, this is not a bad thing, okay? This is the best decision of your entire life, right here, right now. Congratulations. Now listen, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Tomorrow you're going to wake up. You're going to look the same, smell the same. But guess what? Brand new. Brand new on the inside, okay? Now I don't know how God does that. He does a miracle. A miracle is about ready to take place in your life where your spirit is now recreated and you've got a brand new start. 
Okay, that, that old man, that old stuff that you were involved in, that's all gone. You have a bright future with Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'm going to lead you in that prayer. Everybody's going to join in together today with you as you pray this prayer. Now listen, if you, if you mess up on a couple of words, that's okay. It's not about the words of your mouth. This is about the expression of your heart right now. So let's all bow our heads once again. Let's close our eyes. Those of you that are joining us online, if you were watching and you raised your hand, you can pray this prayer with us too right now. Everybody together, say these words. Put your heart on the Lord and say, Father God, I come to you now. In Jesus' name, I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me my sin. Wash me with your blood and cleanse me of my past. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came, that he died, and he was raised again to life just for me. Thank you, Jesus. Let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! Hallelujah! Woo! All right, hey everybody up front, look up here. I, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel waving at you. Pastor Joel wants to give you some free information, some free literature, help you find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do? He'll give that to you. It's simple. It's easy reading, okay? And just points you in the right direction, okay? And then he also wants to connect you with someone here at the church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. You heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get buff like me? They, they always laugh. They always do that. I don't know why they do that. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually, okay? Come alongside you, teach you some things out of the Bible, help you get strong in the ways of the Lord. So you don't go back to the old life, you go on with the new life with Jesus Christ, okay? Take a couple minutes of your time. It's easy, it's free, you need to do it, okay? So if you guys would just make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a great big praise today. Glory to God.